Discord. All right, welcome to the Ali at SBU uh, lecture series with Michael Pfaff. Uh, Jeff Hollander is a workshop leader, so I'm gonna turn it right over to him. Okay, thanks, Liz and Mike. We, we're so happy to have you back with us. Uh, you've been good enough to join us uh, since I think around 2015 or 2016 on a regular basis uh, every so many seasons. And you know we're, we're always happy to hear more about the Ducks. But to get us in the mood for baseball on a kind of dreary day today, let's take a look at some of the uh, some clips from the last year or so, and then we'll uh, turn it over to a more formal introduction. So, Liz, if we could just show where Larry, whoever's doing it, uh, the piece about the 22 year in review. Okay, great. And then we're going to just take a look at one other one. Okay, thanks, Liz. So today we have Mike Pfaff uh, rejoining us. Uh, as you know, he's, if you read the bio, he's general manager and president of our Long Island Ducks, our very popular local baseball team, which has been leading the league in attendance annually. But they are more than just that. And Mike is certainly more than just a baseball executive. He began his career after graduating from St. John's, working for the NFL and working in the commissioner's office in New York City. And he had a very interesting career for about seven years and then chose to leave that organization and that uh, future in football for what I assume was a greater love in baseball. So he came back out to Long Island, living in Sayville, and he became uh, many positions, but immediately, uh, almost immediately went into the general manager uh, position as well as president uh, for more than a decade, uh, past decade. And along the way, he has become one of the leaders of Long Island business community. He's been awarded by the Long Island Business News. He is in the forefront of working with communities, getting charities involved, getting uh, houses of worship, worship involved. And I think it's just an important part of his job, not just filling up seats, but getting the community as well involved because kids from the earliest ages hopefully become fans, they go to games and they grow into the fandom of even becoming people like us on the screen. As they get older, they still love baseball. And I think that's the future of baseball. So with that, I, I'm proud to present uh, Mike Pfeff. Welcome back to a summer afternoon with some of your baseball diehards. And uh, we're hoping to hear a lot of good things about our ducks. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you having me again. It's always fun to uh, to speak with your group, and uh, just a little bit about the Long Island Ducks. So, um, historically uh, speaking, the Ducks were uh, founded in 2000 
Uh, they, they started play in 2000. And the ballpark that we play in, what is now called Fairfield Properties Ballpark, was built in a public-private partnership with the County of Suffolk that owns the ballpark. The ballpark was built uh, for $22.5 million at the time in 1999. I don't want to guess what that might be in 2023 dollars, but um, $22.5 million. Uh, the, the way that it got funded was uh, $14.5 million came from a New York State Economic Development Corp grant uh, championed by Senator Owen Johnson. Uh, another five million came from the county of Suffolk that would own the ballpark, and three million came from uh, Ducks ownership, uh, Frank Bolton, Bud Harrelson. Um, on the county's five million dollar investment, there has been more than twenty five million dollars returned in uh, the first two leases, which were twenty years. We're now in our twenty third year, so we're in the third iteration of of leases with the county. It's been extremely successful. Um, and, and most importantly, it's accomplished its mission, which at the time that it was founded was stated to be improving the quality of life for the constituents of Long Island, not just Suffolk County, but Nassau County as well. And offering, um, you know, doing that by offering affordable, fan-friendly entertainment, clean, safe environment, uh, affordable prices, high quality product, making sure that we're always staying on top of, you know, making sure our product's a good product. So what does that mean? Um, it's clean, it's safe, the team is good, the team wins, the organization is committed to getting the community involved and being involved with the community. Um, you know, the, the, our, our ownership has often described it, um, ownership of this team as like a public stewardship, you know, it's, it's more of a, um, you know, this is Long Island's team. And and quite frankly, it's it's in, incredibly unique. Uh, I grew up on Long Island. I've lived here most of my life, except for those, you know, seven years I was in Manhattan at the NFL. And there has never been anything like this on Long Island in my lifetime. Um, you know, growing up as a kid, the closest you got to a professional field was the upper deck of Yankee or Shea Stadium. And, you know, now, you know, tomorrow at 9 a.m., if you come out here, you'll see kids out on that field playing on on our field uh, being taught by players from the Ducks, professional baseball players. They can come out here on a Saturday night, watch fireworks, watch, you know, some former major league players and, and hopefully future major league players um, hit a home run and win a ball game and then get taught by them the next day on the field. It really is uh, incredible. The access that is provided to the ballpark, the stadium, the field, the players, the organization. They're out signing autographs, you know, every day here. Uh, and, and we've had some incredible ambassadors we've been fortunate enough to have. I mentioned Buddy Harrelson before, who many of you will remember from uh, 1969 World Series Championship. Uh, he's a Gold Glove Award winner, 16-year MLB career, uh, managed the Mets, and uh, then got into minor league baseball ownership and partnered with Frank Bolton uh, to bring the Ducks here. And he was fantastic. Uh, wouldn't leave until every autograph was signed. We'd try to cut off lines. He wouldn't allow it. He, he said, until every person has what they want with him, a picture, an autograph, whatever, or just to talk to him, hear a story about Pete Rose, he wasn't leaving. So um, that, that was really the tone that was set. Uh, from ownership, Frank Bolton too, uh, just, you know, grew out of the ground in Bayshore, um, founded uh, the Ducks and the Atlantic League that the Ducks play in, and completely committed to the community, board member of the YMCA, Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Um, so many different charities have been touched, you know, by the Boltons. And, um, you know, that's really where it starts. You know, it starts with strong ownership, and then uh, it's up to us to provide good management and stewardship and, and making sure that we achieve the mission. And that's what we've been dedicated to. So it's very gratifying to be a part of, you know, something that impacts a community, um, you know, that I was part of growing up, you know, so, so strongly, but uh, it really is unique. I mean, you think about Long Island, like what is the team on Long Island? There, there isn't one. There really isn't. The Jets, their training camp used to be at Hofstra. They left Shea, they left Hofstra. Their training camp, everything's in New Jersey. The Giants are in New Jersey. The Knicks are in the city. Um, I know that the Islanders kind of, you know, Elmont, it's it's like on the cusp of Nassau and Queens. But, you know, as a true Long Islander, I, I know 
factually, maybe geographically, this isn't true, but as a Long Islander, Nassau and Suffolk are Long Island, you know, <laughs> that's just the way it is. So, you know, they're, to me, they're in Queens. I mean, I'm driving to Queens to see the Islanders now. Um, still an Islander fan, no, no, no issues. It's a beautiful arena, but when you look at professional sports on Long Island, we are the only game in town. So we wear that badge proudly. That's why on our across our jerseys, when when we're playing on the road, it says Long Island and not New York. We represent the Long Island region and, and all of its unique communities. And, um, you know, we win. We care about winning. Um, we play in the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball, which is an MLB partner league. And... Um, what that means is, you know, we have a, uh, a contract with Major League Baseball that stipulates how transactions are supposed to occur. Uh, our players are here as a showcase so that they can get signed by a major league organization or potentially a foreign organization as well. There are players that sign overseas and um, they're here just like every player in baseball to get better opportunities to win baseball games. I'd say that the, the, the biggest difference between our product and say what some of you may be familiar with, with uh, like the Brooklyn Cyclones, uh, teams like the Cyclones or the Trenton Thunder or, um, you know, the Somerset Patriots now, those are those are affiliates of one minor league club. So they play under a, a PDL, a professional development license, and their jobs are to develop talent for that one major league team. So, for example, the Brooklyn Cyclones are a A-ball team. So they get the A-ball players of the Mets to develop. They take their instructions from the big league team. They run their business the way the big league team tells them to. And they do with the players what the big league team tells them to. With the Ducks, we are an MLB partner league team. So our players can be signed by any teams in, the, in Major League Baseball. They're not pigeonholed to one organization. They are open free agents to sign with anyone. And our goal is to win. So we're not here to develop talent for one team. We're here to, to play winning baseball and uh, and also provide our players with a platform and a showcase to get better opportunities in the game. And it works. Uh, over a thousand players have had their contracts purchased since we started. Um, you know, most recently, I, I know uh, Daniel Murphy was kind of a, a headline signing for us. And he had his contract purchased by the Los Angeles Angels. He's currently at AAA. Uh, and he's hitting about 320. I mean, he's got a shot to get called up here pretty soon because, uh, you know, for those of you that follow, you know, the Angels are having some struggles um, health-wise. So uh, I'm optimistic that that uh, that Daniel will receive uh, a call up soon. Um, and and this year uh, prior, it wasn't as big a headline because he didn't have as much of a presence in this market as a major leaguer. But Brett Kennedy was our opening day starter, and Brett was signed by the Cincinnati Reds. He was assigned to their AAA team and uh, he got called up and got the win on July 4th uh, at the big league level for the Reds. So, um, and it continues. Danny Echeverria was our starting shortstop at the beginning of the season. He got signed by the Royals. Um, he's at AAA Omaha right now. So, you know, on and on, you know, the the, the wheel continues to, to turn. Uh, the challenge for us, the challenge for me, uh, you know, I work with uh, Wally Backman, who's our manager. Many of you will remember Wally from his playing days in the big leagues. Um, Mike, can we just get a picture up? On, let's, just, let's see if we can get down to, I think it was number, sure. uh, let's get, uh, where's Wally? Liz, if you could bring, or Mike, uh, 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 Larry, whoever's bringing it up, number 10. My, my fault, we didn't, you know, it's hard for us to coordinate as you're talking because that's all right. But you mentioned, I, I, know, I, know I'm, I know I'm skipping around, Jeff, but no, no, you're great. You're great. But we, we lost our stadium pictures. Okay. So here's, here's Here Wally. Okay. So let's talk about him. Then we have another one about him too, I believe. Yep. Yeah. There's Wally talking to Daniel Murphy this year. So, um, you know, so Wally is our manager and uh, I work with Wally closely on uh, putting together the roster of the team. And we are in a constant state of communication with major league teams, scouts, agents, players, uh, constantly remaining aware of who is available, who's gonna become available, what their strengths and weaknesses are, how they might fit on our team, because we are also in a constant state of losing players. 
Um, our players uh, often get signed. And, um, you know, just this morning I came in and our second baseman is uh, coming to an agreement with a foreign league team and most likely, uh, you know, we'll have to be pulled from the lineup tonight. So, uh, you know, if they get that agreement signed and the transaction is completed, he won't be available to be in our lineup tonight. So I'm pretty sure when I hang up with you folks, I'm going to be on a phone call with Wally and we're going to be talking about, you know, what we're doing tonight um, on the infield. So. Uh, we've been preparing for that loss for a few days. We we have a pretty good idea where we are, but that's that's one small example of kind of you know every position on the team. Um, it is so transient that uh, you know you could have upwards of you know fifty five to sixty transactions a year uh, with the Long Island Ducks. So the wheels always turning. The agent community knows it. The player community knows it. Um, you know the, the MLB teams all know it. They have, again, that that contract signed with the Atlantic League uh, that stipulates how transactions are to occur. So the process is, is, is very simple for them to execute. Uh, it's been well communicated to the to MLB and to the team. So everybody knows what to do, how to enter the quote unquote portal um, to, to purchase contracts. And, you know, we're just we're just always, you know, building and rebuilding our team. Um, could you explain we, when you say that this, these transactions keep occurring and he people come and go throughout the year? Does Major League Baseball or the teams that are purchasing their contracts do anything to compensate the time and effort you've put into keeping them marketable? Yeah, so there is an agreed upon uh, transaction fee that uh, they purchase the contract for. And uh, that is for Major League Baseball. If, if a player does matriculate to the Major League level after having his contract purchased, there is a bonus. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it is not a major source of revenue for us. Um, on the business side, you know, that's the baseball ops side. On the business side, our, uh, our business really relies upon ticket sales. Uh, you know, you look at Major League Baseball and they're a $10 billion a year revenue company. We fall pretty far short of that. Um, their main source of revenue is broadcast rights. So they have, you know, a tremendous uh, amount of resources due to the fact that they sell their broadcast rights for billions of dollars. So uh, when they take a little haircut on something like, you know, the pitch clock coming in, which is a new rule, and their gates get a little shorter, in terms of uh, time of game, which I'll get into in a second, but um, it doesn't it doesn't hurt them too too badly. You know, for us, our four streams of revenue are ticket sales, sponsorship, food and beverage sales, and merchandise sales. All of those are centered around people coming out to the ballpark. So, without people coming out to the ballpark, you literally you know have no revenue. So that's really what we focus on uh business operations wise is selling tickets, you know again making sure the products a good product so people keep coming back here. Um we're in our 23rd year. So uh you almost have to kind of reinvent yourself every year. Uh shore up any weak points, you know, um no matter how non-sexy they are. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we started a project to replace the rails in the ballpark. And that's, that's like, great, you replace the rails. But if we didn't, you'd notice it. And it would be kind of a, you know, the, the product would degrade if you didn't take, you know, advanced steps to get ahead of projects like that. Because, you know, I'll bore you with a detail on a rail for a second. Like, if a, if a steel rail starts to degrade, what happens with steel in an outdoor stadium like this is in the winter it contracts in the summer it expands and when it does that you know for 20 years in a row the concrete starts to break when the concrete starts to break the water seeps in and it starts to get rusty and then rust starts pouring out over the concrete and and you see you know the rails and the concrete is it, it's it's a terrible look and by the way if it degrades a little more than that it starts to become unsafe so it's not a small project because if you've been to this ballpark, you know how many rails there are here. I mean, the whole ballpark is filled with, you know, these green rails. Um, so we went through the process of repairing all the concrete, rep replacing all the rails. 
Um, you know, it was it was a significant project, but just something like that, people won't notice when they walk in the ballpark that specific item. But when they walk in the ballpark, they will notice, wow, this ballpark is in really good shape. The field looks great. The ballpark looks great. It's clean. Everything is in very good shape for 23 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, almost 9 million fans now. That is a lot of wear and tear on a facility. Uh, and just a few notes about the facility. Uh, you can see some of those rails in that picture. Um, the the Next to the national grid net zone sign there behind home plate, you can see some of those rails. You could also see them in front of the people sitting in front of the sign. Um, you could see them up on the suite level. That they're they're everywhere. Um, you could see them next to the to the dugout. Uh, you know they're 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 literally everywhere. But um, we have a six thousand seat ballpark. Fifty four hundred of the seats are downstairs, and when I say downstairs. Um, I mean, not on the suite level. When you look at the top of the picture, you see luxury suites. We're looking at the third base side there. Um, the first base side is a mirror of the third base side. In all, there are 20 luxury suites that seat 20 people each. And in between them, there are 200 club seats, which is like a, a seating patio. And there's a 126 seat bar restaurant called the Duck Club uh, inside there. So, uh, but total capacity upstairs is about 600 and downstairs is 5,400. Uh, the playing surface is Kentucky bluegrass. It's a natural grass surface and it takes a tremendous amount of maintenance, repair and improvement. Um, so it's not just a facility, uh, you know, the the, electric the plumbing the generators all those things that, that you're working with you're also working with you know making sure that that natural grass field is in as good a shape as a major league field and i think if you come out to this ballpark and then you go out to city field you'll see that our field may even be in better shape at this point on the last mets home stand i was seeing they had a little yellowing on their field which you won't see here um you know i think they had a concert event that may have affected them their interesting note you know, the players aren't the only ones that kind of, you know, get their contracts purchased or move on. Uh, the current Mets head groundskeeper is former Ducks head groundskeeper, a guy named Billy Deacon. So, um, you know, they watch what we do and uh, many times, you know, either, either try to uh, mimic it or, or uh, take it them for themselves. Uh, you know, I remember when I first got here in 2002, things like, um, you know, the, the wacky between innings promotions and kind of the fun things that, that we did to entertain fans was, you know, a, a little bit scoffed at by MLB clubs. And now they're all doing the same thing. You know, they're all doing it. They started doing it probably like 14, 15, 16 in that time period. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's popular with fans. So if it, if, if it resonates with fans, we do it almost, you know, uh, regardless of, of how it looks and, um, you know, that that's the nice thing about this business. I said before that, you know, for those affiliates like a Brooklyn, you know, the Mets tell them how to operate the business. They tell them what to do, who to sign, who they're getting uh, as players, as coaches, as managers, what what merchandise should look like. Um, you know, they right down to soap in the dish. They're telling them how to run their business. Nobody tells us how to run our business here. We're in complete control. Um you know, we sign our own players, we, we sign our own coaches and managers, we hire our own staff, we order our own merchandise, we, we uh, run our own food and beverage concessions company. Uh, you know, we're in charge of the facility. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's fully in our hands. So uh, those are kind of the main differences. And, uh, you know, we're, we're in our 23rd season now, we're nearing our 9 millionth fan, which is uh, a record. Uh, we were the fastest team in North American sports history in a ballpark this size to reach 8 million fans. And, um, you know, we've had, we just celebrated our 700th sellout uh, this season. So it's been successful. Uh, you know, we remain humble and hardworking and dedicated to the mission. And uh, we're looking to just keep it going as long as we can. Okay, great. So Mike, uh... Just 
the piece, it, we're going to take a look at the, uh, I think the Waddle shop, if we can find that one, I think is 15 and 16, Liz, but the, I know you said that they don't tell you what you have to sell or what you can sell. Give us an idea of what uh, is sold, because I think some of your, when I walked around there, I, I found a, I found it fascinating, you know, there were different types of things. When you go to the regular state, you know, when I say the major league stadiums, you know, they're all hawking this, uh, what seems to be the same product all the time. I think just before, for that maybe that's not right maybe no th th those are the all right you want to talk about the food uh the that's the uh that's that's yeah. the store right there jeff um you know in yeah, terms of unique, in terms of unique items uh i think the one that we had the most success with is our uh, quacker so um quacker is i might have one in here yeah I do. <laughs> of course i do uh so this mm -hmm. is a quacker that comes with a lanyard. This one's tied up. Um, one of my kids must have gotten in here, but this is uh, what a quacker looks like. And um, kids love blowing on these things. I'm sorry if you've come to a game and they've sat behind you and annoyed you or driven you crazy, but these things, we can't stock enough of them. Uh, people that come in, so this lanyard will unwrap and you can wear it around your neck. And Kids will just run around the ball, and adults, kids at heart do it also, will run around the ballpark and just blow on this thing all night long. So um, apologies, again, if uh, this has ruined your night <laughs> once in a while. But this is a very unique item to the Ducks, obviously. And, uh, you know, this, this is something that uh, I think the genius of the Quacker is that the majority of these that get purchased end up on the Southern State Parkway on the way home. And then people have to rebuy them when they come back with their kids. Uh, so a lot of repeat purchases on the Quacker, but that's kind of a unique item. Um, we, we do sell a lot of novelties. Again, we want to be uh, affordable. And I think what you see at major league stadiums, like for example, they're selling a new era hat, which is the official hat of major league baseball. It's the on field cap and um, the new era cap like at Yankee Stadium, I think it's like $46 hmm. for a cat. It's almost $50. And, and they charge $50 for parking. And the ticket is like, I mean, you, you go up on their website and try and buy a ticket right now. It's a lot of money. So um, a $50 hat doesn't really sound like anything that is affordable, you know? And, and um, so we pay the same prices that they pay. I mean, we, we probably pay more wholesale than they pay, quite honestly. Uh, but we charge 30. So uh, our margins are much smaller. And uh, we have much greater challenges, obviously, a tremendous amount less revenue. But um, again, it's being dedicated to that mission. Uh, but a lot of novelties like the quacker, the foam fingers, you know, the things that are like $5. Those are the things that we that we specialize in, because really, I think many times parents want to get in and get out. Um, and, and make sure, okay, son, I want you to be quiet about getting something from the store. So I'll get you this baseball, you know, baseballs, we sell a tremendous amount of, uh, in this picture here, you're looking at some, uh, infant and toddler shirts. We do a lot of business there as well, but again, affordable, um, you know, infant and toddler shirts at city field are, you know, 40, $50. Like it's crazy. Uh, you know, we're, we're much more like 20, uh, to 25 on the same exact items in many cases uh, that they're charging much more for. So uh, the store itself, you know, we'll, we'll do uh, our player wear. So players that, uh, you know, are on our roster will be wearing a certain uh, brand and make of shorts, t-shirts, hoodies, hats. We put all the player wear in the store, but uh, undoubtedly the things that we sell the most of are the kids novelties, the baseballs, the quackers, the foam fingers, uh, infant and toddler wear, and um, t-shirts. Okay, great. So you get an idea of what they do carry now. Uh, uh, Quacker Jack. What is the? Uh, I know that he. We. I've even seen him on the campus at Stony Brook. He seems He's there today. He's actually oh, he uh, at Stony Brook, I believe, in the. Um, Cancer Center. He's uh, he's making an appearance today at Stony Brook. So, um, you know, look, Quacker Jack is the star of the show. It, it's 
I often tell players, you know, because you will get players that have ego from time to time and, and other people, the most important guy in the organization is hanging up in the bathroom. It's true. So hmm. without him, you know, when fans come out, if Quacker Jack is not at a game, that's a serious issue. Like, where is Quacker Jack? My kids came out to see Quacker Jack. Quacker Jack dancing on the dugout. All you have to do is follow Quacker Jack around a little bit and see the reaction that kids and, and families have. And, you know, the smiles that he brings to people's faces, uh, you know, it, it, it is a, a fantastic character. Uh, the, the mascot outfit itself, I think, is a 10 out of 10. It is better than, um, you know, in the four major sports, they have mascots that can't come close to what Quacker Jack is. He's won best Long Island mascot, I think, 14 years in a row now in um, the best of Long Island voting. Fans love him. And why wouldn't you? I mean, it's just he's everywhere. He's at schools. He's at um, community events. He's at charity events. He's at camps. Uh, he's at every Ducks game. And, uh, you know, just an incredible character and a, a great mascot an ambassador uh, for all that's good about Long Island Ducks baseball. And, and, you know, I often say also, you know, in 50 years, we're all gone. He's still going to be here dancing on the dugout. <laughs> that's great. And I, I know that I did notice when I went on your site, uh, many schools are visited by him, even in our school district, and I'm sure all the school districts on the island. How does a school uh, go about or a community organization go about scheduling something with him? Yeah, our group sales department uh, is really the best place to start because many of the schools have their night at the Ducks and uh, they'll be able to either perform the anthem or serve as the color guard or do a pregame performance. You know, one of the things that that we work very hard on in the off season, I often get the question from people. So like in the off season, do you get a chance to take a break? And like, what do you guys do? And it's the opposite. You know, we we have a um, very short period of time to kind of bake the cake for the next year. So um, when you think about everything is on a one year contract, you know, your players, your coaches, everybody, uh, you know, your vendors, and you have to kind of rebuild Rome every year and um, get creative in that space, too. But but the sales part of that is. You know, you have so much inventory. You have 48 outfield signs, 10 scoreboard signs, nine balcony signs, 20 concourse signs, 88 pages of yearbook, 20 luxury suites, and 400,000 tickets to sell. And you have to do it by opening day, which is like April 22. So when are you taking time off? <laughs> like, there's no, there's no relaxing. It's, we take a week off, we close the office between Christmas and New Year's. Um, and that's really it. I mean, it it's go, go, go. So um, part of that is our group sales department, which, you know, Long Island is 120 miles long. And, and there are, I think, 220 some odd school districts. And, you know, I'm, I'm from Sayville, but, you know, the town next to me, um, you know, Oakdale and the town next to that Great River and, and the town across from that Bohemia and uh, they all have an elementary school, a middle school a high school, Boy Scout troop, little leagues, dance studios, temples, churches, uh, you name it. And and every single one of those should have a group night at the ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're reaching out to all of those potential uh, you know customers to come out and experience, you know, what it means to have a night out at the ducks. And um, you know, it's it's participating, it's being involved, it's being part of it. And, um, you know, we're, we're not just out there like, hey, buy a ticket. It, it, it's kind of the whole experience. And, um, you know, these these schools, you know, this is an elementary school picture where Quacker Jack visited. What we'll do is um, we'll set a date where it's convenient for the school and schools have gotten much different over the years, obviously, due to security measures that are necessary. But uh, we work with them to have a time that works for them where Quacker Jack will go and make an appearance at the school. And like, how much fun is that? You know, you're sitting in class and elementary school. We did it, you know, for my kids elementary school where Quacker Jack is literally like walking through the halls and going into classrooms and taking pictures and high-fiving kids. And, um, 
you know, it, it, it's a fun diversion from the day. Uh, and of course, you know, the teachers and, and the administrators have all approved it. So it's all good. Like we're not walking in there off the street disrupting school. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to kind of, you know, let the kids know, you know, you look at these kids in this picture, they have their down jackets on. It's winter. You know, there it's a way to stay relevant, to stay in the community. We participate in parades throughout the course of the uh, off season, whether it's the holiday parades, um, you know, around um, the, the holiday time or in March, you know, the St. Patrick's Day parades are, are very uh, popular in all the different markets. So being involved in the schools, being involved in, in all the different uh, areas that people congregate and come together as groups, we want those groups to come out to the ballpark and they make up a tremendous part of the audience at every uh, and each duck game. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand electronically. Uh, of course, uh, we don't we have too much time left, but uh, the one question I don't know if we addressed, and maybe we could just take a look at it, uh, Mike. Uh, during those very dark years, you know, the COVID years, 2021, I believe we lost the full season completely at the major league. Well, not the major league, but certainly at the minor league level. And how did that impact some of the players that were in development? Did they leave and go into something that was maybe a little more dependable if they could find work, you know, during that time and not come back? And did you find that uh, sponsorships too? Did they stay with the team? Obviously, they didn't couldn't advertise at games, but. I assume many of them came back uh, in spite of uh, the loss of a year. Yeah, it was 2020 that we lost a full season to COVID and we worked very hard to try to get some sort of clearance uh, to, to play. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, due to the uncertainty surrounding the situation, uh, you know, we were unable to, to play in 2020. So uh, again, Major League Baseball having the broadcast revenue was able to essentially play on what was a sound stage. They had empty ballparks. If some of you remember, they had cardboard cutouts in their seats, some of them, uh, to simulate what fans would look like. Uh, but they were able to ring the register on broadcast revenue and stay afloat uh, and pay their players because of the, the, the uh, broadcast rights package. The Ducks and leagues like it did not have that advantage. So, um, you know, it was a complete loss. And, um, we refunded all of our sponsors and uh you know the thing that i'm proud of is that you know we didn't lay off a single person uh we kept everybody employed we got creative uh we pivoted to what we could do which was uh you know get creative and um we were permitted to have participatory things uh, take place in the ballpark so um, we started an adult kickball league and we had a lot of participation across long island for the adult kickball league. Um, we also acted uh, as a COVID vaccination center with our partners at Northwell Health. I would say uh, scores of Long Islanders got vaccinated here. Uh, we were operating from eight in the morning to eight at night, uh, providing vaccinations over months and months of time. Uh, here at the ballpark. Um, well, Northwell was, we weren't, you know, Quacker Jack wasn't giving anybody any shots, but, um, you know, we we used the ballpark as a uh, COVID vaccination center. So it was a really difficult time. I mean, we lost a tremendous amount of money. Um, we are fortunate again that, you know, that ownership that is so dedicated to the community wasn't thinking about their own financial well-being, but thinking about how do we keep this vibrant and relevant and people employed and stay in a ready position to, uh, as soon as they, they let us get back to doing what we do. It was incredibly challenging, but, um, you know, very, very thankful that we had the support of ownership. We did, um, as far as it relates to the players, yes, they did not have baseball to play for the summer and, um, you know, not, not to, um, it, it, no disrespect to them intended, but that was like the least of our worries. You know, I mean, our business was literally crippled and we, we were fighting for our survival. So, um, you know, the players did not get to play baseball. And then the, the effect that that had on the following year, 2021 was just as difficult, if not more than 2020, because we had to um, enact 
testing protocols to keep our players uh, safe. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just, well, we go by the New York state rules. We played in New York state, in Connecticut, in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, in West Virginia, in Kentucky, on and on, North Carolina, and every state had different rules. So, and they had, each team had their own medical partners, like we're Northwell Health, um, York in, in uh, Pennsylvania and Lancaster in Pennsylvania have WellSpan. That's just two examples. They're giant healthcare companies that have their own protocols that have to follow directives from the state and mandates and everything is different in every state. It was uh, a really difficult experience. It was great to get back on the field, but uh, I, I would never want to relive 2020 or 21, obviously. Uh, much more, uh, you know, there are people that obviously suffered much more, uh, but, uh, you know, our organization was was uh, was really going through a difficult time too. Um, we were, we were would... happy to get out of it. Uh, we did see a much a lighter player pool, because what happens is many players who are thinking, uh, you know, do I continue playing? Do I continue to try? I didn't get signed by the Yankees. Should I sign with the Ducks and give it another shot? Those players retired. So the player pool was uh, did shrink dramatically. And uh, but I think at this point, uh, what we're seeing, especially now you look at our roster, uh, 15 players have major league experience and seven have triple a so that's 22 guys out of 25 have triple a or major league time on our roster i think the talent pool has been replenished nicely and um you know we're back to full strength great thank you now right, we have a couple of questions that young lady up in the corner go ahead hey okay. hi uh first of all lynn i have to just tell you i just read your chat you're hysterical Anyway, I want to thank you so much, Mike, for coming today because, first of all, I learned more than I ever thought I would about the Ducks. And uh, I love the Ducks. I love going there. I love everything about it. And uh, for all our grandparents out there, what is the best age to start off your child, your grandchild, come, going to a game? Because I know too young is not good. You know, they will... Uh, be annoying to everyone. So what age do you feel would be a good, because my grandson walks around saying baseball all the time. So I have to show <laughs> well, Britt, really is. Well, Britt, first of all, thank you for coming out. And, uh, you know, that that's that's why we do it is is for, for people like yourself who enjoy it. So it's gratifying to hear that. And I hope you keep coming out and, uh, you know, bring your grandson out as soon as you can, because uh, we do have people that uh, bring infants out, and I think that might be a little too young, um, especially on firework nights. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, my kids started to come out around two or three, you know, once they're able to kind of walk and and um, they were able to walk before that. But, you know, once once they're able to walk and you can hold their hand and walk with them you're good because this really is the ballpark where people bring kids for their first baseball game. If they have to leave, the investment is not so great that you go, we're staying, you know, I paid 400 bucks for these seats. We're not going anywhere here. It's not that case. You know, you, you can, if it's the fourth inning and you know, you need to leave, you don't feel quite so guilty that you made an investment. So, um, and, and really Sundays I would recommend, for children because there are two opportunities to get on the field. Uh, we have a pregame catch on the field before every home Sunday game where all you need is your glove and a baseball um, and, and you go out on the field and have a catch uh, for 15 minutes before the game. And then after the game, uh, we have run the bases. And that too is for kids and kids at heart. So if you want to run the bases with your grandson and, you know, you can do that after the game, and it's just a great uh, experience to have with a family member uh, down on the field taking pictures and running the bases. I feel <laughs> that we are so lucky on Long Island to have the Ducks. I really do. I can't tell you how much we all appreciate it. We really do because it's, it's a great place. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Larry, go ahead. Uh, Mike, you mentioned the Ducks – joined the Atlantic League in 2000. When did the Atlantic League actually start and how did it come about? 
So the Atlantic League started in 1998, Larry. It was a um, it was Frank Bolton who founded the Ducks, also founded the Atlantic League. And what happened was he had had owned affiliated minor league teams. You know, he 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 was a long he is a Long Islander, and his dream was to bring an affiliate to Long Island because he saw this market as one that for some reason did not have a minor league team. And, you know, for example, New Jersey had, you know, five or six different minor league baseball teams. And here on Long Island, which, you know, is I think it's bigger than 22 states in the union and could be its own state, um, you know, didn't have one. So he felt very strongly and I think rightly that there should be minor league baseball on Long Island. He owned the Albany Colony Yankees and felt that that would be the team to come to Long Island, a Yankees affiliate. And uh, I don't know if you recall the uh, Howie Spear gambling trial and, and issue back in the early 90s, but George Steinbrenner got caught up in that. He got uh, suspended from baseball for a year. This was in and around the same time that Frank Bolton owned the Albany Colony Yankees and was going to bring them to New York. Uh, there was a vote because they would have been inside the Mets territorial rights. And um, Frank very was told that they had the votes to bring Albany Colony to Long Island. And then the Howie Spira thing happened. And the people in the room, as the story goes, felt that a yes vote would have been a vote for George Steinbrenner and a no vote would have been a vote against him. And people were anti Steinbrenner at the time. So they voted no. Frank uh, Bolton uh, being who he is, was very um, unhappy about that. And it dedicated him at that point to creating his own league so that he wouldn't be dictated to by Major League Baseball and uh, their their rules, uh, especially as it related to um, the ability to be close to a Major League ballpark. There are territorial rights in Major League Baseball. You can't build a ballpark uh, in Major League Baseball or affiliated with Major League Baseball inside i believe it's 35 miles of home plate either way uh it might be 50 I, I i don't know exactly what the mileage is but it's 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 this ballpark is inside the mets territorial rights um since the atlantic league was not at the time affiliated with major league baseball we did not need major league baseball's approval to build it so that's why frank created the atlantic league um and got many of its first stadiums built thanks mike thank you fred go thank ahead you. I have a question, but I want to, I want to proceed that with a statement, which is really a plug for the Ducks. The Alumni Association of my alma mater, which is SUNY Potsdam, recently had an outing earlier this summer at, with the Ducks. And let me tell you something, for only $40 per uh, admission, we were treated to a dinner in the picnic area. We had tickets right around home plate. <laughs> And because many of our graduates were, uh, are, were Crane School alumni, we got to be featured singing God Bless America during the seventh mm. inning stretch. And of course, after that, we all had our pictures taken with Quacker Bush. It was fantastic. <laughs> what a great evening. One more thing, my synagogue will be participating in Jewish Heritage Day in August awesome. for this year. So well done. Here's my Thank question. You. Are there any statistics that show how the Long Island economy has benefited from the ducks. Yeah, so um, we we keep a uh, pretty close track of things like the sales tax generated through uh, ticket sales, sponsorship, food and beverage sales. Uh, you know, it's been over the course of time, tens of millions of dollars back to, um, you know, the, this uh, this region that, that have gone back uh, on, on what was, again, not a tremendous investment and um it, it was just a great idea at a time that that you know was right and um it, it has benefited uh, tremendously we're proud of that and uh look to continue that that moving forward thank you okay uh, len you had a question uh, i think you're trying to hook up uh, quacker jack with a uh... you know if i if jeff one thing on that last question too that that uh, i'd note when the Ducks got here, and I say this to people um, in the town of Islip, uh, I, I say it, I, I don't mean it as a, as a put down. I mean it as, you know, it's factually correct. When the Ducks got here uh, to central Islip in 1999, um, it was a different place. Uh, you know, since we've been here, 
there has been Toro Law School, Toro College of Health Science, uh, Pulte Homes built a condominium community that's now Timber Ridge. Um, there's now two hotels on the adjacent property to us. Steel Equities just purchased NYIT sprawling campus. The Sousa complex was built across the street from us. Uh, on and on. There has been tremendous, the Islip Town Firefighters Museum, tremendous amount of development in this area since the Ducks got here and proved that people could come here to Central Islip and have a safe, enjoyable night. And so much so that now coming into Central Islip, on, on their, their sign, they say it's a home run community. And what I remind some of the folks, you know, in Islip was before we got here, you know, because sometimes you start to get taken for granted a little bit to be in, in full disclosure. And uh, I say, you know, before the Ducks got here, it was a run home community. Now it's a home run community, right? So a tremendous amount of development since the Ducks got here. We're happy to see it. Uh, but it's not just the financial benefit that has spun off directly from the ducks in terms of the payments the ducks have made, the sales tax generated. It's also the development that's gone all around us. And I mean, right around us. They're building on our like right field wall steel equity. So, um, you know, they're, they're the tremendous amount of development that's gone on here and continues to and will continue to because the ducks were here. Uh, big box stores, that that mall that's across the street from our ballpark. That was a single supermarket when the Ducks got here. Now they have TGI Fridays, Target, Home Depot, um, Panda Express, uh, Beth Page, T-Mobile, on and on. I mean, uh, the, the development's been incredible since we, we proved that this was a place that Long Islanders would come to as long as you had a, a clean, safe environment and a good product. Great points, Mike, because we felt very safe walking from the parking, you know, into the end. And it was impressive to see all the development around you. Uh, actually, I don't, I'm not sure who this was. We just have a number, but someone was asking about what is the most popular promotional event. And I, I noticed that when you said that you work year round and you take maybe just the, you know, Christmas to New Year's week off because you've got to start again for the next year. I, uh, when reading the, the uh, on the website, your promotions require the sponsoring group to come up with at least 1,500 handouts. So that seems to be a very large endeavor. You don't just do that uh, two days before the event. Uh, the amount of planning and ordering and you know promoting must be extremely large. But what are your most popular events? Or are they all popular? Because they seem like you draw very well every game. Well, we we uh, we certainly do start early. I mean, we for example, PC Richard and Son has been a sponsor of the Ducks since inception. Uh, they're fantastic, and and Greg Richard and his family and and everybody over there has been so supportive of the Ducks. Um, if you need a TV, buy it from PC Richard and Son because you're helping support Ducks baseball. Um, but when uh, we, for example, have a, have a partnership with them where they are the sponsor of opening night. I will be in touch with them in October, beginning of October, to talk about the giveaway for opening night in, in 2024, because there is such tremendous lead time. And that's another uh, part of the business that's changed so dramatically since we started. Uh, you used to be able to, like a bobblehead, for example, very popular giveaway item. You used to be able to order a bobblehead. It would be a 90-day turnaround. You could count on the delivery date being accurate. Uh, and the price was about $2.99. You could get a special down at like the, the baseball winter meetings and, you know, buy them for maybe $2.99 each, a quantity of $1,500. Nowadays, um, they can't tell you exactly when they're going to get here. They tell you that you should uh, have at least uh, 180 days. That's six months lead time. And it's about $7 a doll. So what sponsor is, is okay with that? You know, like it's very infrequent. So what you see a lot of big league teams do is they buy them. They commit to them without sponsors, which is something we're not going to do. You know, we don't have the, if we had the TV rights package, we would, but um, you know, they buy them without sponsors. And then if a sponsor comes aboard, they can reach out and get the sponsor put on them. So um, it's just a different process for us, you know, having having to have that lead time uh, just to get the price down to like a six, $7 level. 
uh, you know, it's made giving away bobbleheads, for example, much more difficult. But to answer your question about the most popular promotion, it is undoubtedly far and away, without question, fireworks. Uh, we have fantastic fireworks shows here. Uh, they're they're right behind the center field wall, uh, and we have uh, really a grade A production. I mean, what what you see. Uh, at Jones Beach or what you see, uh, you know, at, at the biggest firework extravaganza is what you will see here. And um, the ticket price is, you know, we don't we don't charge any any giant premiums. Um, you know, for if, if you buy a $17 ticket, you're watching nine innings of great baseball, all the promotions and a fantastic fireworks show. So it really is a tremendous value. And, um, you know, we have great partners that provide the fireworks and, you uh, you know, that that is our number one far and away promotion is firework shows. All right, thank you, Len. And we we're just about out of time. Len, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think it's time for Quacker Jack to have a partner. I mean, girls love baseball too. And we and we really want to get more women involved in, in, in watching baseball. And look at what, what is done to soccer. My God, USA soccer team is enormous because of, of the participation by girls. Newsday does a fantastic job of, of promoting girls. Of things, so so maybe we need I don't know Seal Teal or somebody who can get in there and 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 you know give give uh, Quacko Jack a little competition. <laughs> I like it, Len. Yeah, we uh, so we we have had uh, as a visitor to our ballpark Graham Quacker, who is uh, Quacko Jack's <laughs> grandmother, and um, you know she's she's pretty popular when she comes out. So you're you're not wrong. I mean. Uh, you know, the female mascot does very well here. So uh, maybe we just need to bring Graham Quacker out a little more. That's funny. <laughs> Great. Uh, any other final uh, question? Uh, we, we, Mike's been very generous with his time. We appreciate that. Any other quick thoughts? Uh, I think you've answered, you've answered so many things. You know, I, I think that, you know, even though we're a minor league team, you know, in a sense, it's really a major operation. I don't think most of us appreciate what goes into this. I was always under the impression, Mike, that it you know was a seasonal. Well, I knew it was more than a seasonal job because you have to do preseason and post. Speaking of post, though, I, you guys made, I believe, the first half uh, playoff uh, qualification. Yeah, the season in, in this league, uh, like many minor leagues, is split into two halves. So you, right. we play a 126-game season, 63 games in the first half, 63 yeah. in the second. Um, the winners of each half meet in the playoffs, and the winners of the division meet for the championship. So we won the first half, so we've clinched a playoff spot, and uh, playoffs start on September 21st, and uh, tickets will go on sale uh, this week for playoffs. Just a question, since I know the players, for the most part, play because they love baseball, whether they're hopefully on their way up or if they're on their way down, you know, the reality of Major League Baseball is, you know, it comes and goes, but there's no, pretty much no guarantee. Do they get any additional uh, monetary uh, incentive to play in the playoffs or is it bragging rights? Well, you know, the players, these are professional baseball players, so they're, they're geared to winning. And, you know, it, it is all about trying to win a championship. Um, no matter what level you're at, every professional athlete will tell you that you compete to win the championship. So um, it is, you know, a major uh, source of, um, you know, uh, driving them that, that really ultimately that they, they want to end up with the trophy. And uh, for us, you know, we don't make a lot of, we don't really make money on the playoffs. It's, it's, it extends our season two weeks. And the reason for that is, you know, as I said before, you know, we take six months to sell tickets for opening day. And then for the playoffs, you know, if we put tickets on sale Thursday, we have like two months. So having that shorter window means less groups, means less opportunity to, to fill the ballpark. Um, but what it does is it elongates the time that you're paying the players, right? So you have two extra weeks of payroll, you have more bus trips, you have more hotel rooms, you have more per diem. So your expenses continue, the meter keeps running, the revenue is not there like it is in the regular season. So playoffs for us are not really a revenue generator. Um, and, you know, the players, when we win, we do get some beautiful championship rings. I'll tell you that. Yeah, that's great. 
All right. Well, I think we have a pretty good overview of the business of sports related to our Long Island Ducks. Uh, as Diane mentioned before, you know, we, let's go and enjoy enjoy it for what it is. We're lucky to have the the team uh, locally. Uh, it is an extremely economical day away with the family. You can take you can take everybody, your extended family, and it will cost about the price of a ticket to uh, Yankee Stadium on a prime sold out day. So. Our, our city field. But anyway, we thank you so much. Keep up the great work. You know, after a couple of decades, uh, you're certainly not slowing down. Your enthusiasm and your leadership is wonderful. And uh, we can't thank you enough. And please, you know, if you want to get in touch, go on their website and figure out how your group might want to go and enjoy a day at the ballpark. With yeah, that, thank you guys so much for having me. And, and look out for Quacker Jack at Stony Brook later today. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank Take you care. for joining. Thank you.